and I'm happy that you're here again. Um, Frank Rausch is, I would say, one of the leading uh, interface uh, designers. Um, many of you probably know the, the <laughs> probably know Vicky, the Wikipedia uh, adaption that he did and which makes my life a lot happier when I go to Wikipedia and I don't have to look at this crappy layout that they had before. So, um, yeah, but I think he's done a lot more and he's gonna tell us about, I'm happy that you're here. Maybe. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So the thing you're feeling right now, I think in German we call this a Mittagsloch. Is that the right word? Um, I stay away and I hope my mic will keep working. Uh, what was the movement with the head that you did? Was it this? Okay. Stand? Okay. Well, I, I, I can't really do this. But okay. uh, so I make apps. Um, my job is making apps and whenever I meet new people and they ask me what do you do, tell them I make apps. And then people think I make these little squares and that's, well, I really like the simplicity in this. Uh, it's really way more convenient than telling people what I actually do. My accurate job description would be something like this, user interface typographer, who knows what this is. Can't really know it, but uh, Georg knows it. Okay. No, I made it up. And basically that means I specialize in putting words on Okay. So do you guys know this problem when you like tell someone what you do for a living and then they think it's not a real job? And it's kind of this kind of uh, welcome to my world. So um, putting, you know, putting text on buttons. How how hard can that be? Um, that's exa exactly what I like about typography, though, is that most people are not even aware how important text is and the shape of text is for everything we do every day, especially on digital devices. I won't move anymore now. Okay. So just look at this. Um, text is everywhere in user interfaces. It's all over the place. And text is not just another ingredient, it actually is the user interface. And text is what makes all these things understandable and usable. Imagine what would happen if we just removed all the text, then there wouldn't be any interface left, right? So, or look at this iPhone setting screen here. It's all text. There's no meaning left when you remove the text. So um, I have the impression that many traditional typographers have tried to avoid designing for digital stuff for as long as possible. I was at the Frankfurter Buchmesse recently. Yeah. Absolutely just what I thought. They were still discussing uh, you know, the, the future of the book. Anyway, um, so why is that? Why have, why have traditional typographers um, not been interested in designing websites from the very start? Why hasn't this been a hot, a hot topic uh, since uh, 1994? I have a theory. Um, I, I don't know if you saw the 90s website uh, before. The typography that everything on the web has to look like shit. For example, like this. This is the Microsoft uh, 1994 website. Uh, it looks like the end of culture and civilization, I would say. Um, <laughs> And this doesn't look like the beginning of the new typographic era with great new opportunities. And also this device here, a computer tisch, do you remember these? Um, so uh, of course no one could, nobody could really imagine sitting in front of one of these and reading like seven books of uh, Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or whatever. Uh, this is more like a torture device for reading. Um, so, of course, back then, a traditional book provided a better reading experience than a computer desk a computer or a screen. Um, but when we talk about the screens right now, what we talk about is actually this. And um, so, if you ask the question, what's the future of typography? Um, it's already here. What's the future of reading? It's already here. Look around you. People read all the time, all day, every day. They read Twitter, they read WhatsApp, they read Facebook, email use blogs and over the past couple of years the technology has become so much better we have all these new things like handheld devices instead of computer tissue uh, then we have high resolution displays we have backlit backlight free displays like an ebook reader for example we have decent browsers we have decent layout frameworks we have web fonts we have app fonts we have kerning support which is amazing yeah absolutely 
so great. Um, we have hyphenation, we have open type feature su support, we have variable fonts. So there are really not many excuses for bad typography. So great. Um, is reading on screen now, does it feel the same as on paper? I would ask the question, is that really po uh, necessary? Is that, not if it's possible, is it necessary? Is it the right question? Because even paper had real problems, if you think about it. Limitations. Look at this. Um, oh, yeah. Ah, okay. Stop this. What do I do now? I'm still in front of 150 people and they want to hear me. This one? So this one? Ah, ah, okay. This may work now. All right. So let's look at the problems that a traditional newspaper or a sheet of paper actually has. A fixed font size for everyone, a fixed format, and a packed layout. So that means uh, the format dictates what you have to say or what you can say, how much you can say. It uh, determines how long your texts are going to be. And um, so that's actually, paper is quite bad if you compare it to software. In the early days of the internet, people tried to bring this concept of a, sh of a page into the web as well. So this is this, the, the home page of uh, the New York Times back in 2001. And this is what the New York Times looks like uh, these days. So finally, people have realized, or designers have realized, that trying to save space, the cost of readability, bullshit if your canvas has an infinite size, like digital, by definition, has. Um, so instead of a fixed uh, sheet of paper we have, or fixed dimensions, we have a computer screen, which is also flat. I admit that. but. It's just more like a viewport, a window on an infinite canvas of information. And the very, very same content can be viewed on a variety of, of uh, different devices and resolutions. And at some point, you realize that this has nothing to do with paper, but you can still read stuff on this. So um, if you try too hard to uh, simulate paper, you get something like this. This is not a photo of a book. This is actually uh, iBooks version one on the iPad one. How can you tell that this is not a photo of a book? Nobody would print a shitty book like this, right? Just look at this. <laughs> Painful. Yeah. Tries to be a book, but it fails. Now look at this. This is a more recent version um, of iBooks. It doesn't try so hard, but then you still get the page flip and you still have pages, which I don't really think are necessary. Um, and I'm sure this is going to go away soon, so please forget paper. And uh, when you design reading interfaces and um, do digital text layouts, because the simulation is never as good as the real thing. Simulation is good to help people overcome like the, the fear of new technologies, but it's not something. A simulation of paper is not going to be as good as paper, so why try? Forget paper. The difference between analog and digital, um, the fundamental difference, I think, is that in analog stuff, a person does the layout, and in digital stuff, an algorithm does the final layout of something. So um, let's look at a traditional typography workflow. I've never done it like this, but I heard that this is the way people used to work. So you have a content, then you have a typographer, and then you have a design on a piece of paper. Okay printed and done. And a digital workflow looks quite different. So you have a um, typographer who designs an engine of some kind, like an algorithm, 
And then this algorithm can take all kinds of content, even the content that wasn't there when the algorithm was written, the engine was built. And then this engine, the, the typographer uh, loses control over the engine, and the engine does its thing with the content and layouts this for all kinds of different devices. So I think that algorithms will replace manual typography in the long run, but don't worry if you're a typographer. As a typographer, you will design the algorithms that do all this stuff that you used to do manually. And I know that old school typographers love repetitive manual hard work, and I understand that light, adding line breaks and you know, adjusting text flow is a great thing. And of course, the results right now are way better than if, you do, if the computer tries to do it. But I don't think that's always going to be the case, that it's necessary to have a human doing all the detailed uh, decisions. So instead of designing an individual thing, you design the engine, and the engine does the layout. And when I say engine, I don't mean, or when I say, you know, um, algorithms, I, I really mean algorithms, just HTML, CSS, of course, also that, but also pieces of software that take and analyze and reformat textual content so it looks good and works well. Um, if you were here for the Web Phone Day two years ago, uh, you know that I'm a big fan of Wikipedia. And you already see, hope, I hope you see the problem here. Um, yeah, so I, I mostly read um, Wikipedia on my iPhone, on my iPad, um, and I, you know, on my iPhone, this is what the official website looks like, this is what their official apps look, uh, app looks like. So I, then two years ago or something, I, I decided that I would build the Wikipedia reader app of my dreams, which is this. Um, it's called Wiki. Like Wikipedia, the Germans will know why it's called Wiki and not Wiki. Um, my goal was to create something uh, that works, gives you the best reading experience on all these devices. A showcase of good typography, as good as it gets for digital stuff. Let me show you how it works. So when you open the app, you get some, um, an overview of stuff that other people are reading right now articles that are popular. Then you can search for stuff like Friedrich Schiller, for example. Oh, there he is. My favorite feature is that you actually can read the text here. Um, this is the table of contents where you can scroll to a you know, specific part. You can open the zoom in onto the um, images. And good typography, of course, always starts with a good typeface. Um, obviously, if you make a long-form reading app, even more so. And that's why Wiki ships with 12 quality fonts for um, styles of Diogenes, four styles of Comet, four styles of Camingo code for like code snippets and stuff. And now you're like, uh, well, Frank, so you picked some fonts. That's not typography. And you're right. That's not the whole story. So let me just show you some details uh, of uh, typographic details that were done by algorithms, mostly, that I created. So uh, these are the search results. This is what they look, look like. And instead of displaying them like this, the algorithm looks into the, the excerpt from the uh, article and um, avoids the redundancy um, of, of uh, having the word twice by just integrating the, the article title into the excerpt. And saves a lot of space for digital, uh, small digital devices that makes a lot of sense. And also, let me show you what the search results in the official Wikipedia app look like. Um, so, I decided to show fewer results but with more information density here because normally when you look for something, uh, it's one of the first four and not one of the first ten uh, search results. A big topic when you build a Wikipedia reader app or when you work in digital typography in general is reformatting user-generated content. So you get a piece of you know, HTML or even plain text and there are horrible mistakes in it. 
and everything looks like crap. So, uh, Laiengestaltung, that's what Friedrich Forsmann calls this, layman's uh, design. So when you look at Wikipedia, this is what a lot of the tables uh, look like. And of course, people love all these uh, things that you can do when you have all the power of HTML available to you. Uh, you can do inline styles, background colors, and round corners. And most of this I don't want in my app. So how do we do this? No. Um, can't be that hard to reformat this one thing, right? Well, it's a table. Uh, it has some unsemantic class names, it has inline things, uh, like, yeah, class names, inline styles that mess up the layout that I, I really don't want in my app. So how do I do this without breaking anything? We made a Wikipedia app at my company before, uh, and this is what, how, what I showed two years ago. Uh, in our old Wikipedia app, we did this, which is a regular expression that just kills all the styling globally. <laughs> wasn't such a good idea because sometimes it has meaning in the styling and so we can't really destroy everything. So not a good idea. So then I thought we need to be more selective. And more selective is of course, CSS is a selector based language. So why not try CSS for restyling this stuff? No, if you know anything about web development, you know that this is not a good idea and this is also not a good idea. Um, and also, if you don't know what all this does, what it basically does is it slows down the rendering by 300% when you try to view a page, because CSS is just not made for undoing CSS. Well, part, part of, kind of, sort of, but not like this. So this is a simplified version of what I came up with to resolve it. I uh, use a piece of JavaScript, and I remove all this, uh, the style attributes. But before that, I keep a few of them and put them in a, in a list, like the background color, the color position, top left. Maybe I want to keep all the rest of the styling I want to kick out. And this is really efficient, fast, and clean, and easy to maintain. So JavaScript instead of CSS, and instead of regex to clean up other people's mess in HTML. Um, something you will also often see is um, errors in microtypography. I'm obsessed with microtypography. And the big problem is that a modern computer is basically more or less this. It's a typewriter with a c calculator, but more powerful. Um, but it has the same keyboard. That's why people have a really hard time typing even the correct um, characters, finding the correct punctuation on the, on the keyboards. Nobody bothers to type them anymore. So if you learn one thing today in this talk, then please don't use these. They're typewriter quotes. These are the right ones for English. These are the right ones for German. You can also use these, especially if you're a typographer, but never these. That's like a triggering a syntax error in my brain. And ho hopefully, uh, how many of you are typographers here? Ah, okay, so I don't have to explain this to you. Then I don't, also don't have to explain why you shouldn't use these, uh, but uh, this. So Wikipedia, the English Wikipedia, of course, uh, has in their style guide, I think, probably, that all articles must be with dumb quotes. But in the wiki app that I made, all the quotes are correct. How did I do this? Did I just go into every single article and fix the quotes? Of course not. Um, I use a, an algorithm, a ready-made piece of software called Smarty Pants. Um, and you can download it in for all flavors of all languages and just drop it into your project, more or less, and then um, give it a piece of text and then the algorithm <clears throat> ah <clears throat> maybe you should do this uh, um, so this is all the code that I had to write to fix all the typography on Wikipedia more or less for my app um, so there's really no excuse to do something like this. I found this a uh, few uh, months ago. I mean, is, should I call this headline? It's probably, they, they think it's a headline, but it's really hard to read. It has to two wrong apostrophes here. Um, where's the other one here? It has four wrong single quotes, dumb single quotes, and a, one wrong hyphen. And this could all be fixed by algorithms without any problems. You don't even have to teach people to you type it right on the keyboard. 
And there are other libraries that do the same thing. Typeset.js is a fancy new thing for your NPM workflow, if you're into that. PHP typography, if you're old school. And uh, Jolie Tubo, I found this, a new French library. I really like the name. I don't know if it's any good. Um, so there's really no excuse to have wrong quotes in websites or digital products. But you can also have, uh, have some fun with text parsing. It's not just about cleaning up other people's mess. Um, so this is what the article headers look like in Wiki. No, of course not. This is really ugly. I agree. This line break here. So uh, I found out that a lot of Wikipedia articles look like this, and they look way better if I just add a line break after every colon in the title. And then, because I already have the split up the string, I can also you know tweak the formatting a bit and use a nice italic here. And I can also do something like this. Do you see it? I'm going to zoom in for you. <laughs> this is uh, hair space before the colon, which, why not, right? And the beautiful thing, once I've written this code, I can also reformat all the other Wikipedia articles in the world, the billions of articles, even for languages I don't read. So what I do when I have a title like this, uh, of course, this the line breaks are okay, but it looks like shit. So how do we fix this? Fortunately, there's a pattern that I recognize in Wikipedia articles. A lot of articles start with list of or the localized version of that and uh, um, brackets in the end. So I could just use a very simple regular expression. You probably you all love regular expressions because they're the best thing for typographers and digital regular regex. It's a great thing. So you, it looks like I just did this on the keyboard, but <laughs> actually, like this, but um, it actually has a meaning. It splits, these, this thing splits up the string up here or any other that follows this uh, scheme. And I have my three separate parts of the uh, string and I can format them individually, like, for example, like this. And again, the beauty in there is that it works for everything. Once I've defined the algorithm, I can just use the content, put the content in it, and it automatically follows these rules. Let's see what's around this location. So it also, the app also finds articles around your location. And um, you can also tap somewhere else and find a different uh, some stuff around a different location. But what I actually wanted to show you here is that, of course, you know, I use this, the, the thin space instead of the normal regular space because it just looks a little better. Why, why not just do this? You know, it takes like 30 seconds to put this in if you know that it's a problem that can be fixed easily. Um, a great article, by the way. You should check it out. Um, so this is uh, the inline search. If you search within an article, it looks like this. Type something, you find the results. Uh, find the next result. And what I wanted to show you here is that I used a special open type ver uh, feature to get the right version of the numbers in this font. Because this quality typeface here, um, quality font by Jan Fromm, has six different number styles in there. Uh, so num um, tabular, proportional, and all of these for, uh, in medieval lining and small caps. And I use the uh, uh, tabular small caps figures here because they just fit in so nicely in this uh, box. And that's the great thing about native apps. Uh, you have full open type support for everything, almost. And if it's not in there, you can build it. Uh, on the web, it's a little different. But today, I learned. Where did I learn this? Cool. I think I learned it from you. Uh, Variable fonts don't work in native apps. So, but everything else, typography-wise, you can do better in native apps than in the browser because you have just full control and you can even swap out the rendering engine if you want to. Um, so, of course, there are also native, uh, more limited uh, 
uh, platforms where you can that you can build native apps for, like for example this one. So if someone would be so stupid to actually build a Wikipedia reading app for this device, um, they would have some more limitations. As you probably have guessed already, is that I built a Wikipedia reading app for the Apple Watch right here. Um, it works quite well. It's really tiny. I have very thin, delicate fingers, and you can still see, you know, how small this is. So I'm going to search for something with voice input here. I'm going to look for Erik Spiekermann. <coughs> and just, you know, I want to, maybe I want to know when he was born. I already have the answer right there. Fortunately, the, 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 the image format is, you know, you have to make compromises on a small device like this. It's ideal for landscape, not so much for portraits. And then maybe you already found all the information you're looking for. And then the nice thing is, uh, if you are a typography, you can decide that this is actually not a good reading experience. It's a good, you know, for consulting uh, the, the encyclopedia for like 10 seconds, it's great. But then if you want to read the rest of the article, it gives you the hint that you can continue reading. Look at this icon down there, you swipe it up. And then exactly the article you had on the watch opens on, on, uh, on the phone or even on your iPad. It's called handoff. It's nothing spectacular, but... Um, solves exactly this gap between this uh, device and uh, the real reading device. I think the greatest strength of digital typography is that it's adaptive and personal. So, does that mean that you should add settings to everything? Um, yeah, you could do that, but then you would end up with something like this. This is a photo of my Kindle. I didn't do any photoshopping in there. So, you can actually configure this. And why is it even possible to configure this? A user is not a typographer. Why burden the user with so many choices? Why even give them the, these fonts that no, no one can read? Uh, except for, except for yeah, Palatino is okay, but the rest, this is too thin. Palatino is okay for the device, but yeah. But then uh, my Kindle updated itself. And then I said, oh, new fonts. Oh, no, the uh, type options are now on uh, two pages. I can now adjust even more stuff and have even more fonts. Booker Lee is actually quite nice. I like this one. Um, but then there's also open dys dyslexics on, uh, on this one. I heard that it's uh, a great font for people with dyslexia. That's what it was made for. I, thank you. I don't want to say this publicly, but Georg said it. Um, I, I don't know enough about this condition, so you know. I, uh, but I know that um, to everyone else, this is just a grunge font with distorted outlines. So um, probably not the best option if you just put it in the list with all the other fonts for everyone to choose from. Um, so what I would do is I, I would just you know add three different uh, size settings, and maybe an extra one with optimized settings for uh, you know people with impaired vision. And actually what Vicky does is it respects the system font size by default, but then many people complain they want to have a different setting in Vicky. So I said, okay, well, then you can override this. You can deselect, use device text size, and then choose default large and extra large. Of course, pe some people complain that they want a uh, very microscopic type too, but uh, you know, why give them the opportunity to set something up that doesn't make sense? So I just have options that are... Uh, readable. So yeah, few settings are okay, I think, for reading, and because that's the strength of digital ty typography to be able to pick the font size that matches your vision. Um, but instead of asking the user for parameters, you uh, for to adjust parameters, you could also maybe use the sensors in your device because a smartphone like this has a camera, a proximity sensor, an ambient light sensor, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnetometer, a GPS microphone all built in. Maybe we can learn something from that to adjust the font size. Maybe we have data in the cloud that we can access uh, to personalize things. Um, so maybe all this information could tell the uh, reading device, what's my current reading distance? Am I currently moving? Am I standing up or lying down? Is the room bright or dark? Is the room quiet or busy? Where am I? Is the environment changing? How is my health? The typography could adjust to all these things. 
with sensors uh, to the user's context. So one, one example that you all probably have seen before is this um, night mode. So when it's dark in the room, then some apps will switch to an inverted mode, which is uh, nicer at night. Then the, you could do the opposite. You could, if, if you're outside and you have your phone outside, then it could switch to an optimized high contrast version because you know, for normal reading conditions, it's probably not really hard to see from, from the audience, but for normal reading conditions, it's better to have slightly off-white and maybe dark gray instead of pure black on white. But on, in bright sunlight, you always want the maximum contrast. The app could, the reading app could recognize when I'm uh, walking, for example, and then make the text bigger while I'm walking. Uh, could adjust to the running speed, maybe, and give you even bigger text when you're running, maybe a, li <laughs> maybe a little bolder too, right? Because then try to read something when you're running. Um, maybe when it's raining and you have the raindrops on your display, uh, you could use weather and lo location data to find out about this and then give you a font that's more robust, that you know, works better when raindrops are on the display. It's an actual issue. Um, then maybe you are not wearing your glasses or you forgot your glasses and maybe the device knows uh, that you don't have your glasses on using the camera. Maybe it knows from the health data how bad your vision is. And could adjust the font size to these parameters without the user setting anything. Then maybe if you're in a bad mood or maybe if you're, you know, your blood pressure is really low. No, no just, just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah. Um, so you have all these options, you know, all these different um, things you could do automatically without asking the user stuff. Of course, I'm exaggerating here, but this could actually be used uh, in real life too, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So I'm almost finished. Um, thank you. Um, students often ask me, do I really have to learn how to code? I just want to design beautiful things. Let's say you've designed this beautiful button. That's my answer. And then the developer comes back with this. <laughs> it's blue. It has a shadow. It even has Arial on it, just like the designer specified, right? And uh, instead of wasting your time discussing with developers, you can just build stuff yourself. It's so liberating. So yes, designers should learn how to code and just fix the stuff themselves. And when I started in UI design uh, like 15 years ago, designers were making mock-ups and then hang handing over specs to developers to de develop and that never works. So then in, in the meantime, people have realized that prototyping is actually a good idea, prototyping stuff with interactive flows. Uh, but I think in the long run, designers will also contribute real code to the real code base of real projects um, because design happens in all these phases and also typography happens in all these phases. Um, and typographic decisions cannot really be specified in mockups. They are, live in rules and relationships between stuff and edge cases. And uh, so typography is in the code and typography is code. And if you're really serious about digital typography, write your own code. Learn to use the terminal, write regular expressions, build software, and make the technology do, do what you want instead of letting Adobe shape your work. Uh, if, you, if Adobe shapes what you do, it can be really frustrating, I think. Is this recorded? Yeah, OK. Um, so you, you cannot really advance the craft of typography if you have to ask someone for permission, like the developer or whoever. I mean, I love developers. I'm a developer myself. But you know, um, if you have to ask for permission or you negotiate over design decisions, just it's not very constructive. If, if, so you can't really push the discipline forward if you're a victim of your tools and uh, you're a better maker when you're not just a user. So how, do sh how should we call this discipline of making s digital stuff or putting type on buttons, putting text on buttons? Um, should we call it screen typography? I think that misses the point because it's not about the screen, it's about what happens behind this layer of the screen. We also don't say paper typography, by the way. So uh, should we call it app typography or web typography? Mm, no, probably not. 
It's just like calling it multimedia typography in the 90s, so I wouldn't <laughs> advise calling it any of these now. Um, digital typography, yeah. But, the, you know, desktop publishing has also always been digital from the very start, and that's 30 years ago, and so no. Algorithmic typography, yeah, that's pretty good, but it puts too much emphasis on the algorithmic part, which is not really about. You also don't say InDesign typography or DTP typography. Dynamic typography? Hmm. Hmm. Maybe. It's a pretty good option. It captures the essence of the dynamic nature, but uh, it's also a little too fancy for something that will be normal in like three years. So um, I would suggest that we just call it this <laughs> typography. Um, Everything I've shown today is just typography. It's just, you know, the goals and the criteria are always the same for good typography. And we just need to learn how to use the right methods and the right tools uh, because people will be people and letters will always be letters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. I have a little advertisement here. Cut a little advertisement. Yeah, I can. How much is it now? It's very expensive. It's very expensive. Six like euros. But if you can't afford it, just drop me an email. Oh, I'll I send you a free I code. bought it for one or Seriously. something. Like, hmm? You I bought it for one. Yeah, I raised the price until okay. nobody bought it anymore, and then I lowered it again. Who's That's got it awesome. already? Who's got oh, Wiki already on phone. your phone? Let me know. Oh, too yeah. few, too few. You should really, really should get it. <laughs> Welcome to this uh, shopping uh, thing now. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions to Frank? Here. <laughs> Android? Um, well, the, the thing about, was that a question already? <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll answer this question. Um, the question was, is there an Android version? No, because I believe that it's, the platforms are so fundamentally different, iOS and Android, that you cannot make a universal app that runs on both. And if, you, if you're a one-person team, then it's not possible to do two huge, enormous projects in parallel. So I decided to go for iOS because that's what I know, and that's why there's no Android version. Follow and it's not really question. a business model either, so uh, I don't know if I want to go the Android route. Yeah. Follow-up question to that is yeah. why not HTML and CSS? Um, that's a good question. Um, because I don't think we're quite there yet with the technologies. I have some things that I don't, you know, like the, you, from the user interface perspective, things don't feel native to the operating system on the web. And I think a big part of a good user experience on an operating system is using the platform standards of that operating system. And building a, a native looking app as a web app is confusing and always wrong somehow. So I wanted to go all the way for a fully native experience and also have all the typographic tools I can use. I mean, I use a web view for the article, like that's like a browser within the app, but everything around it is native iOS and I can also use small caps and everything in there. By the way, uh, the open type features in Safari also in the web views is also slow down rendering uh, a lot. So I put them in and took them out again because this was like unbearably slow after using um, open type features for the headlines in a long article. I talked to the guy who uh, develops the uh, stuff for Safari and he said <laughs> about it this much, yeah. I was the only one who complained maybe, I don't know. Um. Thanks Frank for this talk, it was really, really good, really informative. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you said, I, I totally agree with you that typographers can foresee some circumstances um, like light condition and typography should adjust to that. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering um, how, much, how many assumptions we can make on the reader itself. Mm -hmm. um, everyone has their own preferences and their little eyesight issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they vary from person to person. So I'm wondering, is it enough to do a normal type size, a large and X or large, or um, does it need variable fonts? <laughs> and everyone decides for themselves? I think 
the typographer should design, d decide everything that, um, or should only provide options that are within a certain, you know, rule set of legibility. And I don't think anyone can really judge what's easy to read and hard to read if they, they don't have the proper education. So, uh, I, as I said, I got a lot of emails from, uh, from people. Not well, a lot, like three emails. Uh, <laughs> that's quite a lot of uh, someone <laughs> sitting down and actually typing something and sending it off to me, re complaining about that the type is way too big. I was like, what kind of complaint is this? Uh, I mean, you have so much space on, on the infinite canvas, why not, you know, why do you want everything on one screen? But some, it's, some people are used to this and you, you read best what you read most, right? So that's what people say and that's probably true. Some people have preferences, but that don't, don't, doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good idea to have these preferences. So I have a pretty strong opinion on this and I try to limit settings in general to the bare minimum because I don't want to force people into too many decisions about stuff that they maybe not know enough about to judge them. Yeah, but that's open for discussion, of course. Open for discussion out there. <laughs> yeah, please, discuss. Um, it's not actually a question, but just mm -hmm. a, um, information. You showed uh, this website from um, Daily Mail or Daily yeah. Telegraph, and then where the uh, wrong quotation marks and the hyphens were used. Yeah. But actually, um, um, BBC or like um, d uh, digital journalism in England, they use uh, different rules as uh, printed things, and they mm. have different uh, host style. And there, yeah. like at least I know I read BBC's uh, style guys, and they're officially um, using the single quote yeah, and the, 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 the dumb ones. Yeah, yeah dumb and ones. also Spiegel Online does it, and most other German big newspapers do it online. I think it comes from the from the character set limitation because they didn't have UTF-8 encoding back then when they started the websites, and then they didn't have the right people to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. Or something? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Because you could, you could always use... Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I'd rather use your stuff. program yeah. to <laughs> correct yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, the, it's not, this is just uh, n not even my program, but everyone can just use it, and I think it would be fairly easy to implement it there. I don't know what kind of CMS they use, but maybe that's the problem there. But maybe also the attitude is the problem towards typography. Thank you. No more questions? No? Thank you. Thank you.